chemistry students, today we're going to be talking about the aluminum copper chloride lab. This is our extra lab at the end of our flipped stoic unit, so if you get a little bit ahead, uh, here's something that you can do in the last couple of days. So a lot of this is going to be a little bit more um, student driven, a little bit less me showing you how to do it, a little bit more you trying to figure it out. So first of all, um, you'll notice this in your pre-lab. One of the reactants that we have is called copper to chloride dihydrate. Um, so what that means, well first of all, copper to chloride, copper is Cu, and if it's copper 2 has got a plus 2 charge, chlorine's got a minus 1, so it would be Cl2. So that's going to be copper 2 chloride. Um, what dihydrate means is I need to add this dot 2 H2O. Um, so what this really means is that when they um, make their crystals of the copper 2 chloride, that there's some water that's kind of crystallized in the process. So when we come up with the molar mass of copper 2 chloride, we have one copper atom, we have two chlorine atoms, we have then four hydrogen atoms and two oxygen atoms. So really why we tell you that we have this um, this dihydrate means that when you weigh out your mass of copper two chlorides, so you're going to have to find the mass of this. That when you're finding out how many moles of it, that the molar mass, you need to take into account the fact that um, there's also water being accounted for in there. So really what this means is that the molar mass of copper 2 chloride dihydrate um, is not just the mass of the copper 2 chloride, but also the dihydrate. So when you measure it out, you're going to have to take that into account. So um, the next thing, the reaction that we're going to be doing is a single replacement reaction. And for that reaction, we're going to have aluminum react with our copper 2 chloride. And so remember that our, uh, our form for that is A plus BC forms AC plus B. So we're going to be kind of swapping around our metals there because aluminum, remember, is more reactive than our copper. So I'm going to leave it to you guys to predict the products of this reaction. Um, then when you weigh out your amount, you don't have to write into the dot H2O into our equation but you do need to account for that when you find the mass of how much of that copper 2 chloride you need to use. The other thing, uh, the pre-lab is going to ask you a couple questions about um, limiting reagents. So the pre-lab questions for question 3 on your pre-lab is going to ask you to find um, how much aluminum you would need to make it so that way your copper 2 chloride would be limiting. So it kind of leaves it open ended to you. There's lots of different amounts that you can pick. So find out how much of your aluminum you would need. And then it also asks you to reverse the role. So if I took this limiting here and I moved it over to the aluminum, uh, how much then would you need of that? When you actually do the lab, we're going to want the copper 2 chloride to be the limiting reagent. So we don't want to do that part when we actually do the lab. Um, as far as what data you're going to be able to collect in the lab. Uh, before when we did a single replacement reaction in the lab, we did the copper and silver nitrate lab, and we formed uh, silver metal. Here we're going to be forming copper metal, but we're not going to be able to measure how much of the copper we actually produce. Um, what we're going to have to measure is how much of the aluminum we lose. So if we look at what data we need to collect, we need to have our uh, well, first of all, we need to know how much copper 2 chloride dihydrate we have. So we need to find a mass of this in grams. We need to know how much of the aluminum we start with. And we also need to know how much aluminum is going to be ended with. So 
we're going to run out of the, I tell you in the problem that I want you to figure out so that way your copper 2 chloride is going to be limiting how much aluminum to use. Uh, but you're going to measure kind of how much aluminum gets used up in our reaction. So this is going to be our data table here. So there's not a, a ton of stuff that we need to collect. And then for all of these things, you're going to be finding masses. So there's really what you're going to need to collect. Um, if you look through the lab, what I would do is I'd look through the lab questions before you get started on the lab, and that kind of might help you to figure out why you're doing the steps that you're doing in the lab. Besides that, the procedure is pretty well laid out um, for what you're going to do. So let's go over and take a look at a few of the materials you're going to use in the lab itself. So over here we have all the materials you're going to need for the aluminum copper to chloride lab. We have the aluminum foil that you're going to need, and to cut the aluminum foil you're going to use just a pair of scissors so you can get it to the right size to a mass that you've calculated or that you want. Then we have um, a watch glass. We can use the watch glass as both our weigh boat for the copper to chloride and also to cover our beaker with. We're going to have a 250 milliliter beaker, that's where we're going to actually be doing the reaction. You're going to be adding some tap water to that. We have a 100 milliliter graduate cylinder to measure out the water that you're going to be adding. The exact amount of water is not really necessary, but you want to make sure that you record that. We have a scooper, so that way you can measure out the copper chloride. And then the second day after you do the reaction, uh, you're going to be removing the aluminum foil from your solution, and you're going to be using a pair of tongs to do that, so you can reach in and pull that out. As far as safety is concerned, one of the chemicals we're going to be using is our copper 2 chloride dihydrate. Um, and so looking at the safety information here, um, one of the concerns about our copper 2 chloride dihydrate is that this is um, toxic if you ingest it. Uh, so make sure, first of all, that we're not eating it. But it also is a mild body tissue irritant, which means that, again, if you get it on your hands, um, and you don't wash it off your hands right away, that it could cause some kind of discomfort and some itching and so forth. Um, you want to make sure that you keep anything that's an irritant far away from your eyes. So we're going to make sure that we have our lab goggles on at all times. But really, the, the important part of this, wear your goggles. If you get any of this on your skin, the powder itself, or if you get any of the solution on your skin, that you run it under cold water for a long time, flush that area with lots of water, and you'll be just fine. So it's nothing really to be uh, scared of as long as we're wearing our goggles, as long as we're not actually ingesting some of the powder itself.